We're going to be in Judges chapter 14 this morning. If you want to go ahead and turn there. Last night, my youngest daughter said, I cannot wait until today. And I was thinking, oh, she's excited to go to church. I said, why are you excited? I thought maybe it was because she was going up to her new class. Because we go to Waterworld today. So it had nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. So... Uh, but I hope you will join us tonight as we go to Waterworld. Everyone is invited to bring your families. It's going to be a good time. We're going to pray that the weather is going to hold off and that we will have some good weather out there. So we only have five weeks left in our study of Judges. Some of you are thinking, man, I wish we had more. Some of you are thinking, five more weeks? Are you kidding me? But we are moving our way through this book, and we're in the second week of looking at the most famous judge in the entire book, Samson. Last week, we looked at the details surrounding his birth. Today, we're going to look at the details surrounding his marriage, or I should say his first marriage. And as we work our way through the passage today, uh, you could argue that out of all of the judges, even though Samson is the most famous judge, he's also probably the worst behaved judge. He is the one who, at least based on the information we have, seems to violate God's commands and disobey God more than any other judge we have In the entire book, he has the spirit of defiance in so much of what he does. All of us can relate to this. You can all remember times growing up where your mom or your dad or some authority figure told you to do X and you did Y. This happened to me many times throughout my childhood. We were at church one Wednesday night when I was growing up and we were walking outside for some reason and there was this huge water puddle and our teacher very clearly said, do not jump in that water puddle. And I jumped directly into it. And I felt the wrath of my parents shortly after. Also, growing up in my neighborhood, we had some neighbors about three houses up who had a pool. We didn't have a pool. They had a pool. My parents were very clear. You are never to go into their pool unless we're around or there is some other adult around. So me and my sister, my dad was doing yard work one Saturday. We went up to their house. All of our friends were swimming. And so I pushed my sister in, and then I jumped in right after her. Because if I was going to get in trouble, she was going to get in trouble as well. In direct defiance of what my parents had always told us about how we should behave when it comes to being around pools. So all of us act this way from time to time. In Judges 14 today, Samson is going to show you that he is prone to this as well. We're going to see that he operates with the spirit of disobedience, but that ultimately he is still the person that God will use to deliver his people from the Philistines. So as we work our way through the passage today, number one, you're going to see a defiant spirit from Samson. Number two, you're going to see a dysfunctional wedding. And then number three, a precursor to victory. A defiant spirit, a dysfunctional wedding, and then a precursor to victory to victory. Now in chapter 14, it does not ease into Samson's disobedience. We're told at the very beginning that he goes down to a place called Timnah and he sees a daughter of the Philistines and he returns back to his parents and he says in verse 2, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Do you pick up on the tone here? He doesn't say, Mom and Dad, since you raised me, since you have provided for me, I really want your value and your input as I consider potentially marrying this Philistine woman. No, he says, Now get her for me as a wife. So his parents try to persuade him. What's interesting about how they try to persuade Samson is none of it is really spiritual reasons. None of it's theological. Now, if you read specifically that verse, they basically say, well, why don't you try to find someone amongst your relatives or someone who's from our people? And that's really all they say. But there's actually theological reasons why Samson should not date a Philistine. It's Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. I'll read it. You shall not. God tells the Israelites, intermarry with them. Not just the Philistines, but anyone outside of Israel. Giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your souls from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you 
quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. Samson's parents don't tell him, you shouldn't do this because God said it. They don't go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and remind him of that. They also don't remind him that he made a Nazarite vow, which we looked at last week from Numbers Numbers chapter 6, which actually says you are not to intermingle with people from other nations. It seems that the uncircumcision of the Philistines, which they mention in this passage, was not so much a concern spiritually or theologically, but rather culturally. They didn't want their son marrying a Philistine, not because it was disobedience to God, but because of how it would be perceived in the community. The Philistines were considered low on the social ladder. Now notice the last phrase of verse 3 here in chapter 14. It says, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now this phrase in many ways, is the theme of the entire book of Judges. Every judge, the Israelites as a people, throughout the book of Judges, they are ultimately doing things according to what is right in their own eyes. The essence of sin is when we decide to do what is right in our eyes or when we decide to ignore what is right in God's eyes. And so what we see Samson doing here is a microcosm of the entire book. It's a microcosm of our lives. When we are disobedient to God, whether we verbalize it or not, what we are saying is, I'm going to do what's right in my eyes. And the author, unfortunately, doesn't give us any indication in this chapter that Samson is even remotely considering not marrying this Philistine woman. His mind was made up. He was going to do whatever he wanted to do. And throughout his reign as judge, as we're going to learn today and next week and the next week, he pretty much just follows his own agenda because he has this defiant spirit. Now, don't miss the lesson that Samson gives us here early in these verses. You can still be God's chosen instrument to accomplish his purposes and still do what is right in your own eyes. It can happen. So this is not a passage that we should look at and say, oh, well, Samson clearly, he's, he's acting like an unbeliever. Christians, we don't do this. We always act according to God's plan, which is why God always blesses us. Not true. Sometimes God blesses you even when you're disobedient. I don't advise you to go down that path. But God is sovereign, and he is orchestrating things in the world. And sometimes, even when things happen well in our lives, it doesn't always necessarily mean it's because we're doing what God wants us to do. Samson is a great example of this. We don't need to read these verses and immediately just apply them to someone else. When you look at Samson, look at your own heart. Look at your own mind. We make decisions every single day without consulting God. We do this in our lives. We're just like Samson. These verses, even though they might more likely describe a non-Christian, they can describe us as well. We, every single day, have to fight the temptation to do what is right in our own eyes rather than submit to what God teaches us in his word. Look at verse 4. It says, His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord For he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. I want you to look at that word, he, in the phrase, he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Who is he in this passage? He is Yahweh. It's God. In other words, even though Samson was doing what was right in his own eyes, God used that to spark a relationship between him and the Philistines that ultimately down the road is going to lead to the Philistine judgment. Listen to what one commentator 
says about this verse because it's very tricky. It's very confusing, and we need to make sure we understand it. It says, Here would have been a real comfort for Samson's parents had they known. They didn't realize this situation was from Yahweh. They couldn't see that Yahweh was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. This does not mean they were wrong to object to Samson's desires and actions. Nor does it mean that Samson's desires were virtuous or that his bullheadedness was right. It means that neither Samson's foolishness nor his stubbornness is going to prevent Yahweh from accomplishing his design. Yahweh can and will use the sinfulness or stupidity of his servants as the camouflage for bringing his secret will to pass. Now, you need to mark very clearly in your Bible or wherever you're taking notes, this is not a license to sin. This is not a license to disobedience. But what we have to understand is in this passage, we have to rest in the tension of believing in faith that even though we might commit evil and it might make sense to us or it might not, or we have evil that exists in our lives, God can use that ultimately to accomplish his purposes in the world for his glory. In spite of Samson's disobedience to marry a Philistine, God is not taken off guard by this, and he uses that as a spark to allow Samson to ultimately have that relationship, and later he uses it for his glory to defeat the Philistines. His defiant spirit continues in verses 5 through 9. We're told in the passage that a young lion comes roaring at Samson. And the spirit of the Lord, the text tells us, rushes upon Samson. And he tears that young lion apart with his bare hands. This incident is important. Specifically that phrase, the spirit of the Lord. What we're supposed to take from that is, if the spirit of the Lord comes upon you, he can give you the power to do whatever he wants you to do. Now, I don't recommend you go to the local zoo and try to rip up a lion. But in this passage, he gave Samson the opportunity to do that. And after he talked again with the Philistines, we're told that he returned to take as his wife this Philistine woman. And when he does, he notices the carcass of that dead lion. And there are three ways that Samson disobeyed God through this part of the story. Number one, he came into contact with a dead carcass. That is a violation of an Israelite, that you are never to touch something that is unclean. So that's disobedience number one. Disobedience number two is he's also violating by doing that his Nazarite vow. Number 6-6 makes it very clear that Nazarites are to avoid anything that is contaminated, anything that is unclean. And then number three, when he takes the honey out of the dead carcass, he doesn't just eat it himself, he gives it to his parents, causing them to also unintentionally disobey the commands of God. Now, the author doesn't convey to us in this text that Samson, again, ever considered that he shouldn't do this, that this would be wrong. Either he's completely ignorant or he's defiant. My guess is he's defiant. He's just going to do whatever it is he wants to do. And that honey not only leads him to sin, it leads his parents to sin as well, having no concern whatsoever for God's law. So number one, we see a defiant spirit. Number two, we see a dysfunctional wedding. I promise you, however many weddings you've been to, and you've maybe been to some dysfunctional ones, Samson's is going to take the cake. I promise you. Verse 10, we're told that a feast is taking place here in the passage. The Hebrew word for feast here is actually a 10-day drinking fest for Samson and Everyone that's involved, the Philistines, it's all taking place at the home of the bride's parents. 
Now, the fact that Samson is engaging in this drinking fest is yet another example of him violating his Nazarite vow. We learned last week he was to drink no wine or any strong drink of any kind. So at this 10-day festival, Samson comes up with a game in the form of a riddle. And he presents this riddle to the Pharisees. Look specifically at verses 12 and 14. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. Now, we don't have time to read the whole passage, but just one observation throughout this passage, specifically at the wedding, you almost read nothing about Samson's bride. That's dysfunction number one. Samson seems to be the star of the wedding. We all know that the female is the star of the wedding. So the Philistines are not able to answer Samson's riddle. So they approach his wife, who is a Philistine, and they use her to try to manipulate Samson to get the answer. Look at some of the examples of dysfunction. First, verse 16. And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother, and shall I tell you? There's a lot of dysfunction in this verse. We'll get to it right now. Number one, how many of you on the day of your wedding remember your bride telling you, You only hate me. You do not love me. That's major dysfunction. Number two, when she says... Why haven't you told me? Samson's response is not, I'm going to tell you. His response is, well, I haven't told my parents. So why would I tell you? Those of you that have rocky relationships with your in-laws suddenly got uncomfortable in the room. This is not how you want to start off a relationship with your wife. Telling her that, no, if I haven't told my parents about this, I'm most certainly not going to tell you. This leads to all sorts of dysfunction in chaos. This is another bad move by Samson, another example of his lack of judgment. He's not building up brownie points with his new wife. So we're told in verse 17 that she wept before him the whole seven days that the feast lasted. And then eventually he gives in. But when she goes and tells the Philistines the answer to the riddle, Their response to Samson is not the answer to the riddle, but rather the answer in the form of a question, Jeopardy style, if you will. Now, in the context of this passage, the Philistines' riddle can be solved by answering that love is sweeter than honey and Samson is stronger than a lion. The way that the Philistines approached Samson for the answer, that would be the answer to their riddle. But the irony of this riddle is that there is something in Samson's life that is stronger than him. It's love. Samson struggles with women tremendously. So much so that no matter how much strength God has given him, women that come into his life seem to have this power over him. And it causes him to communicate more than what he should communicate and ultimately causes him to have this weakness in his life. Now, Samson ultimately realizes that he lost the bet and he realizes that his wife was involved. Now, here is the icing on the cake of Samson's dysfunction. Look at verse 18. He says this at the end of it. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Everyone's laughing quietly. If you're thinking 
that Samson is referring to his wife as a heifer, you would be correct. Number two, as your pastor, let me advise you, if you have never used that phrase to describe your wife, now would be the time to continue not to use that phrase to describe your wife. The use of heifer here in the Hebrew is just as disrespectful as it is in English. Samson is calling his wife a heifer. Are you picking up here on all the dysfunction? Samson is really not concerned with his wife at all. He's not even concerned with lifting her up, honoring her. He's interested in this game with the Philistines. He doesn't want to tell her the answer. He's certainly not going to tell her the answer before he tells his parents. Not a good move. Then, once she manipulates him and gets the answer out of him, he tells the Philistines, you would not have known the answer if you didn't talk to my heifer wife over here. Bad move all the way around. Now, you've been to weddings where maybe the food was bad, the reception music was terrible, the pastor was long-winded. It, it doesn't come close to this. So rest assured, no matter how bad your wedding might have been, you can always look at Samson's as an example of, well, at least mine wasn't that bad. Major dysfunction happening here. And then number three, we see in this passage a precursor to victory. Look at verse 19. As the chapter concludes, the text tells us, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, that is Samson, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. This is the second time in this chapter that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson. The first time when he ripped the lion apart. The second time when he goes down and he defeats these 30 Philistine men. Ashkelon is one of the leading cities where the Philistines occupied. So God, through this unhealthy wedding, through this defiant spirit, is beginning to use Samson to weaken the forces of the Philistines, and he returns with the spoil and the garments of the men that he slaughtered, and he gives it to the 30 men that he made the bet with. And then the text tells us he returns in anger to his father's house. This victory over the Philistines is meant to be understood as a precursor to the much larger victory we will read about in Judges chapter 16. This will not be the last time we hear from the Philistines. And unfortunately, in verse 20, the text actually tells us that this whole encounter ends basically just like it started, with massive dysfunction. Look at verse 20. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. This is like a soap opera in real life. This is evil. The entire picture of marriage in this chapter, in the life of Samson, is belittled. It is not a picture of a faithful husband, nor is it a picture of a faithful wife. So the story of Samson in chapter 14, as a groom, leaves us desiring a better groom. In case you're wondering, that would be Christ. We, as his church are the unfaithful bride. But the good news of the gospel is that for all that are in Christ, we will be presented to him as his radiant bride. Not because of our faithfulness, but because of his faithfulness. Unlike Samson, who ignored his wife, belittled his wife, and ultimately abandoned her when he allowed her to marry his best man, Jesus does not treat his bride in this way. How do we know that? Because we can look at the cross. We can look at the resurrection. The wrath of God on the cross was poured out on Jesus rather than on us. We deserve the wrath of God, and Jesus stepped up in our place. And the reason we know that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient is because of the resurrection. We can look at the cross and the resurrection as a picture of one who is the ultimate groom. Romans 4.25, it says Jesus was delivered up 
for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So in the crucifixion, he endured the punishment that we deserved. And in the resurrection, his sacrifice is deemed sufficient. And Paul tells us, we are justified. But there's a difference between what we read in Judges 14 and what we know about Christ. This battle that Samson has with the Philistines is a precursor to something else. But brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, there is no more battle. It's over. Christ has won the war. When he defeated sin on the cross, that defeated Satan. Yes, we have battles with him daily, but the war is over. One day when Jesus returns for his church, he will destroy Satan once and for all. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. That's why I say that the cross and the resurrection is not a precursor to a greater victory because the victory has already been won. It's over. We know as Christians that when we have been saved from our sin, we're talking about the punishment of our sin. When we are being saved daily, we're talking about being saved from the power of sin. Sin no longer reigns supreme in our lives if we're in Christ. We are now characterized by his righteousness, not by our sin. But one day when Jesus returns and he collects his bride, we will be saved forever from the presence of sin. Jesus is the faithful groom. He is the one who will return to collect his unfaithful bride But the good news of the gospel is that for any that repent of their sin and believe in Jesus, they will have the best groom possible. That is the good news of the gospel. If you do not know Christ today in this room, don't you want that? Don't you want to be freed from your sin? There is no other way you will be freed from sin and death apart from Jesus Christ. He is the only way. You cannot defeat the power of sin on your own. It is only through resting in the work that Christ has done for you, receiving it by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is the gospel. And we find the gospel through looking at the failures of Samson's wedding in this passage. Let's pray together. Father, as we get ready to partake of the Lord's Supper, it takes us back to the gospel where we realize that the only reason that we have life is because of the death and resurrection of your son. So as we approach this time, help us to reflect and meditate. Again, if there's any unconfessed sin in our lives, may we confess it before you so that we can come before you clean as we partake of this family meal. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.